Do you want it timed or do you yeah, just... Right. Definitely. Does any, can anyone time it? Yeah, what are we, what are we doing? Make three sure minutes. that the clock is always visible to both sides. Yeah, 100%. Three minutes, three minutes. And do you, what, what's the topic that you want to talk about? Just about um, as, what is required for an individual to attain paradise and what beliefs must an individual have to attain paradise. That's okay. Good, good discussion. That's a good discussion, yeah. Right. I look forward to that. Bob, well, I'll just ask the question and then Bob can have three minutes. Would you like three no. minutes, then Bob three minutes answer? No, he'll ask the qu first question, don't time that. Yep. Okay. I'll reply in three minutes and then he can reply in three minutes. Cool, happy with that? Cool. Okay. Yep. Ready? Okay. Uh, so, yeah. so, the question that I wish to pose is what is required uh, within the framework of Christianity, like, what, like what, what must an individual believe in for them to attain paradise? Okay, three so minutes. three minutes. So in answer to the question, the prophets make it very clear that a Messiah is to come. For someone to attain salvation, they must accept the Messiah that is described by the Old Testament prophets and that is acknowledged by the apostles, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, that they must accept him as their Lord and God, that he is the Son of the Father, that they accept him as their Lord and therefore become his student and his follower, applying his teachings to their life insofar as they are able in increasing measure and growing in that teaching, and to live within the community of faith, the covenant, um, the covenant that Christ himself establishes on his own person, which is embodied within the church, that new covenant you belong to through a, a verbal acknowledgement, a heart ascension, a mind commitment, and through a ritual called baptism, you take on these things, they adorn you into the body of Christ, and because you are in the body of Christ, on judgment day, you will be saved. Uh, that was Pause, the, yep. and then give him three minutes. Okay. Okay. Three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, that was very interesting. Um, the thing is, I don't find through the teachings of Jesus that those points that you mentioned are substantiated. So, for example, yeah. does Jesus ever say that one must believe that I am their Lord and Saviour to attain paradise? Does Jesus ever say that one must believe that I died for your sins and that is the way that you must attain paradise? We don't find that anyway in the teachings of Jesus. So, if you can please reference specific verses in the Gospels from the words of Jesus himself yeah. where he says, to attain paradise, you must believe that I am the Lord and Saviour, you must believe that I am going to die for your sins, um, and for you to attain paradise or salvation, you must believe in those things. Okay, so is it, do you want me to want to continue? You've still got three minutes. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> the first thing is that I reject the premise of the question. The premise of the question is faulty and flawed, because you assume that Christianity is defined solely by the words of Jesus, and that is something as a Christian that I reject completely. That's an Islamic polemical argument that has no basis in what Christianity teaches. Christianity teaches that we embrace the prophets and the apostles teaching. Yeah, show him the time. Let him, let him see. The, the, can I see it as well? Yeah, sure. Like, so it, right. So it's based upon what the prophets and the apostles teach. So the premises of the question are entirely false and therefore we don't need to jump through the hoops of Islamic polemic to defend our faith. All we need to do is stand firmly upon what the apostles and the prophets teach about Jesus Christ. Now, in the Gospels, Jesus himself says, if we go and we I'll try and find it quickly in Luke, if I can, bear with me while I do so. Uh, do, 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 do. So we're looking for where Christ talks about or prophesies his crucifixion. Bear with me one second. So when Christ speaks about his own crucifixion, he talks about dying for the sins of the world. And he says that. In fact, I'll show you in the... I'll actually show you from the Eucharist. And then I'll show you the crucifixion prophecy later. So when Christ inaugurates the Eucharist, he says this. Right. He says, When the hour has come, he reclined at the table and the apostles were with him. And he said, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer 
For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken up the cup and given thanks, he had said, Take this and share it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given, it, and, uh, given thanks, he broke it, gave it to them and saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after he had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you. It is the, the new covenant in my blood. So he's saying that his body and his blood is given as part of the establishment of the new covenant. It is that new covenant that is the means by which we are saved. So Christ is talking about his oncoming suffering. Now, we don't need to jump through the hoops that you've made, but time. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, got three minutes, or just ask you Three minutes, please. Um, so, that was very interesting. Uh, the first statement that Bob came up with was, we don't need to actually take our, like, base our theology based on Christ. It's the prophets and apostles of God. You're called Christ Christians. Christ is in the name of your religion. How can you stand here, seriously, like, it's all for the viewers as well, how can you stand here and not have any saying from Jesus that actually uh, dictates all the beliefs that require for you to enter paradise? As a Muslim, I have every single statement from, from Muhammad telling me what, what I need to believe in to enter paradise, right? We are Muslims. This is very clear. In Christianity, it should be the way that all the things that require an individual to attain paradise, Jesus has to say, guys, by the way, you must believe uh, that I will die for your sins. This is how you attain paradise. You must believe that I am your Lord and Savior. Those are basic things because if you don't believe in them, you're, you're not a true Christian. We all agree on that, right? So what, why can't I find that in the sayings of Jesus? That what you quoted there does not help you at all. I mean, I, I don't deny that this is in the Gospels. There are many incidents in the Bible um, that are there. For example, when Jesus um, talks to the Pharisees and whatever, do I have to believe that he said X, Y, Z to the Pharisees to attain paradise? No. There are certain incidents in the Bible that are necessary for an individual to believe in and interpret in a certain way that he would die for our sins to attain paradise. I don't find that in the sayings of Jesus, right? By the way, I'm a Shia Muslim. So if you, if, if you can quote from, um, from what's his name? Um, from Simon or, or Peter Petrus, I believe that he's a, he's a successor of Jesus. So he's also uh, an authority upon me. Paul, Paul is a nobody, right? All these other individuals that you take your religious from, the so-called prophets and apostles, Jesus didn't say go, um, go and make them your authority. Jesus didn't say go and take your religion from them, right? So why do you do that? Like you, you, you just take, you, you've just made Paul an authority. Where did Jesus ever say go take from Paul? Where did he do that? Why, like, so why do you do that? Okay. Okay, is it my time? Yeah, one minute left if you want to I'm finished, I'm done. Go three minutes. Okay, I mean, it's a simple catchphrase to say that, you know, Jesus didn't teach that. So I would now ask the brother to explain to me what did Jesus mean when he said, this is my body which is broken for you, and this is the blood of my new covenant, this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for you. If he's saying that Jesus didn't teach it, please explain to me what Jesus meant by those words. Now, the reality is, that he wants to castrate the Christian faith to suit his own polemical agenda. Christians do not need to jump through this hoop. We have no shame in standing on the apostles and their teachings about Jesus Christ, and we will get into them. Um, but Jesus himself talks about his own suffering, and I, I do want to find it. This is the problem with three minute debates. Brother, can I ask you a favor? Could you Google where Jesus prophesies his own crucifixion and suffering? and talks about he will suffer for the sins of the world, where Jesus mentions that. It's Matthew 17. Matthew 17. 22. The joy of Google when you've got a crap memory. <laughs> so, right, what verse? 22. Verse 22. Now remember, he said that Jesus did not teach that he would suffer, but listen to Jesus' words. And while we were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. Hallelujah. So he does prophesy his own death. And when he says in the communion, uh, the, the Eucharistic uh, inauguration, my body is broken for you, my blood is shed for you, I want you to answer me why he is saying my body is broken for you and my blood is shed for you. What is he meaning, my body is broken for you and my blood is shed for you? Um, can we find another one? One minute, Bob. Yeah. 
Uh, let's have a look. So I think another one can be found in Mark 9.30. Now you said Peter was a... a, 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 a did I... Did sorry, I sorry, bear with us, bro. We're having a conversation. Yeah, have you just told this gentleman that I'm not a Christian? Bro, I, I'm, I'm having one, a conversation. Have you told him that I'm not a Christian? I am saying, bro... How do you know that okay. I'm not a Christian? Can you pause my time? Yeah. Sorry. Well, don't be rude, okay? I'm not, he, he just come to me and he said that I'm not a Christian. I'm saying that I doubt that you're a Christian. You That's how what I'm saying. You, how can you doubt if you're the man of God? Why are you interrupting no, a perfect Christian no, discussion? Because no, no Christian, because no Christian would have a problem right, saying right, Jesus on, is the Lord on, of Muhammad. Yeah, so. You've got, uh, yeah, one minute. Okay, now in uh, Mark chapter 8 verse 31 it says and he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again why must the son of man suffer that's my second question so you've asked me two questions my two questions are to you why does jesus say he, his body must be broken for you and his blood shed for you and why does he say that the son of man must suffer must suffer could you answer those questions um First and foremost, I did not, I mean, I'm, I was very, very specific in my claim. I did not deny that Jesus does suffer. Look, I, I, I told you, I'm a Shia Muslim. I believe he, that he suffered. I, I don't believe that he, he was crucified. I believe that he was uh, tortured. I believe that he was punished. But I do not believe that he was uh, he was crucified. anything at my church and he's telling me I'm not Christian. Can you, can you stop the time? Please? Yeah, pause his time. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. What are you doing? Yep. <laughs> Absolutely annoying. Uh, so can you, can you stop the time again? Yeah. Two thirty. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, thank you. So, I, I was very specific in my claim. I don't believe that. Um, sorry, I, I do believe that Jesus suffered. Like this, this is also within Shia theology. We, we just have a different interpretation for it. But, but but the point being is that you dictate that an individual must believe that Jesus died for our sins. I must confess that. I must say, Jesus, you died for my sins. Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior for me to attain paradise. Why couldn't Jesus just say that? Why couldn't just Jesus point towards individuals? Um, for example, we, we as Shia Muslims also believe that uh, you know Simon and Peter was the successor of Jesus. So, what, so why doesn't uh, Simon or Peter teach that? Why does why does Paul, someone who was crucifying Christians, then later on, ooh, I got a light on my face. Now I've I've seen Jesus, and he told me this and this. So Paul is the he's the judge, and he's the defendant, and he's the claimant in all of this. Like this doesn't make sense to any rational person, in my in my view. So I, I did not deny that Jesus uh, does, you know, talk about how he will be punished and so on. But I'm, I'm saying you must specifically present um, an authority that is agreed upon, whereby that, that they have to believe that, that Jesus is, is the um, is the Lord and Savior, and, and that he died for our sins. In terms of him, him, uh, in terms of why he was punished or, or why he, he was tortured and went through this, in, in Shia theology, we believe that that many prophets went through uh, um, torture and pain. So basically, resemble the, the torture and pain of, of the Prophet's uh, grandson, Al Hussein, son of Ali. This is what we believe. This is our, this is our like personal theological opinion. Obviously, you don't accept that as a Christian, but this is what, what I believe. Okay, in, in my sources. So it, that question doesn't help you at all. I, I'm done. You got 53 seconds left. You done? Cool. Okay. So do we we say that that christ suffered christ has blatantly said that he will suffer and die and raise on the third day and what i notice is the brother at least in that three minutes didn't answer the question why jesus said that his body would be broken and his blood would be shed for you not in any way that matches up with what jesus said because jesus said that his blood is the new the blood of the new covenant that's what Jesus says. In the Gospel of John, he says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, that my flesh and my blood are real food and real drink, you have no life in you. Christ said that he would suffer and die on the third day, that the Son of Man must suffer. But why? And the reason why is when you look at the prophets, they talk about the suffering servant in Isaiah. He says that he sh by, his, by his stripes, they will be healed that he suffers because of their sins. So the Old Testament prophets are saying that the Messiah suffers as the suffering servant of Israel for the salvation of those who come under his kingship and his authorship. Now, you want a specific set of words. It's the classic, 
give it me in these specific words, otherwise I won't accept it. Well, okay, fine. Show me where Jesus says that he is the Messiah in the Quran. Yes, the Quran says that he's the Messiah, Allah says that he's the Messiah, but Jesus never utters the words from his own lips. But he wouldn't accept that argument. He'll say it's okay for the Quran to say that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, that's great. It's okay for me to say that the Apostle said that Jesus Christ and his suffering is the cause of our redemption. Now, you see, you've got to be consistent in the polemics that you use. And if you can't be consistent, you should abandon your polemic. So now I'm going to add a th third question. The second question you have yet not answered. What does Jesus mean when he says, my body is broken for you? My blood is the blood of the new covenant and is shed for you. Answer that question. And then apply your own principles. Show me in the Quran where Jesus' own words are, I am the Messiah. I want to see those words from Jesus' own lips. Because the reality is that you believe lots of things that aren't in your Quran. That, uh, that aren't the words of the actual prophets. They're either said by the prophet in another book or they're said by Allah about a prophet. So you're applying a double standard and I invite you to be a sincere dialogue, uh, to, to be a sincere interlocutor. And if you recognize that you've just worked to a double standard, to retract it and not to use it for the remainder of this debate. Are you willing to do that? Well, I don't think I've done anything that is contradictory. Um, in terms of what you just mentioned, like the last bit of um, you know, bring me a, a statement of Jesus. In, in the Sunnah, we do, we, we have in fact an authentic hadith from Jafar al-Sadr, where he quotes, he's, he's a sixth Imam of the Shia, where he quotes uh, Jesus saying, Ana um, abduka ibn amatuk wal masih, which means I am, um, I am your slave, the son of, uh, of, of your, um, of your uh, female slave, Mary, and, and I'm the Messiah. So this is an authentic hadith. We don't, we don't you know, the, the, we have we have the Quran, we have the Sunnah. We don't, you know, just rely upon uh, upon, upon the Quran. And in in the Quran, uh, and uh, in in the Quran, the the rest of the statements. In fact, all the statements are the words of God. We believe are the literal words of God. So I have something which is better than the statements of Jesus. The words of God, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Okay, that, that's, so that's that's the um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, I need to hear actual like quotes. So so, so so does Jesus literally say that I will shed my blood for you for your sins for your repentance? You're the one who's making the extrapolation. You're, you're the one who's adding those things. As in, I will uh, shed my blood for you. As in, to cleanse you from your sins. Who says that? It's not there. You're the one who's adding that. So that's why, as a Muslim, I find it very, very difficult to to accept the the statements of some apostles. Did Jesus point towards them? He did not. Did did his uh, successor um, Simon Peter point towards them? He did not. Show me. Right. So if you have a direct chain where Jesus says, I, Jesus, leave, leave behind so and so that you take your theology from. I also, I also accept it. By the way, I'm being very, very generous. <laughs> the authors of the, of the Gospels are anonymous. Only, only John claims to be an eyewitness. And he's the latest um, edition. So Mark or Matthew, depending on which one you think is the first Gospel, they, they don't even claim to be eyewitnesses. Why the hell should I even accept this book? It's just it's like, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really trying here, guys. It's very difficult. 48 seconds. I'm done. So, ladies and gentlemen, what we've just seen is the brother has exposed himself on a double standard. He has said to me that it is okay for him to use hadiths when I said I wanted to see the words of Jesus in the Quran, but yet when I say that Christianity works by the whole teachings of the Bible, he insists that I should only show you in the words of Jesus. Now, I, at this point, free myself from this double standard I gave him the opportunity to be an honest interlocutor and to retract his double standard and instead he doubles down on his double standard. But I'm free of that. And I've made it very clear from the beginning that as Christians we base our beliefs on everything that the prophets and the apostles teach. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 it says, in him, speaking of Christ, we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. 
in Hebrews 19 verse 14 it says how much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God the Father cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God so the scriptures are really clear Jesus Christ's suffering and death is the means of our salvation Jesus said my body was broken for you and my blood is poured out for you for the new covenant I notice for the third time in a row he has not addressed that verse and now we see what happens classically with Muslims doing da'wah in the park their problems just mount up because as they don't address one point I simply add another point and another point so the next point I want to point out is that what do the prophets say about the Son of Man, the Messiah? They say this in Isaiah 63, reading from verse 9, So he became their saviour. In all their affliction he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them in his love and in his mercy. He redeemed them and he lifted them and carried them all the days of old but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned himself to become their enemy. He fought against them. Then his people remembered the days of old of Moses. Where is he who brought them up? For out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock, where he is who put his Holy Spirit in the midst of them, who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before to make for himself an everlasting name it's talking about one who is suffering for redemption and notice the trinitarian language in that passage you've got god the father god the holy spirit and god the son who has become their savior because in all their affliction he was afflicted that is why he had to suffer that is why the son of man in Jesus' own words had to suffer for the salvation of all. Three minutes. Yeah. Um, so, just, just to directly address the verse, can you can you go back to Luke and, and pull that out, please? I want it verbatim, not your. Yep. <laughs> Let's have a read. Pause his time. Pause. Yeah. Yeah. Pause it. Can we get the Greek out? Uh, no, it's okay. Do, do, you get, do you guys know Greek? He does. Oh, great. Right. Jesus says, oh, sorry, bear with me. Okay. So Jesus says, and it's down here. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with me I'm on the table. And he talks about Judas. So I'll hold it. Um, so the verse, he, yeah. So the, this great verse, oh my God, we've just discovered something really. No, just stay there, please. Stay there. <laughs> The, the verse that you've oh, seen it and I've read it. No, no, can, can I? Because I need a verbatim because you oh, just you've just read it verbatim. No, no, I, I can't I can't remember it, so I, so I actually need it in front of me. Please. Go on, thank you. Um, so he before, if anyone actually like is watching this video and realizing what he said, he said, I, I've given you as an as an as an he's basically uh, talking about how how Jesus is, is referring to his physical body. Here, the verse is actually referring to his to the bread. So so. The body that there's being referenced to is, is the bread. So when he's saying, uh, take my bread for you, or, or sorry, take my body for you, he's, he's talking about how, how the bread uh, represents his body. That's, that's literally you. what it says. Take this, take this and share it among, among yourself as in, as in the bread. So, so it's not talking about how I'm going to die and then, uh, you know, uh, my death will cleanse your sins if, if, if you believe in it. Like, that, is, that is absent. And the Old Testament quote we just, we just mentioned, it doesn't help you because those are not the words of Jesus. I need actual words of Jesus. And, and even Ephesians and, and, and Hebrews. Who wrote that? Was that Jesus that wrote that? No. So why, why are you quoting it? I'm a Muslim. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Simon, and, Simon uh, slash Peter. I don't believe in those writers of Hebrews and Ephesians or whatever. Why are they an authority? Who made them an authority? 
You, you completely ignored that question. Does Jesus say you are you are an authority after me? That, um, does he prophesy that after me Paul will come and write so and so, or you know, um, uh, for example, Philip? Like, like, there are actual individuals during the time of Jesus that, that call Jesus God. I, I do believe that. Okay, but are they are they an authority? Just does Jesus point towards them and say, take your theology from from those individuals? He does not. So why so why do you guys do that? Are you done? I'm done. Right, so, so the question that we're actually debating is not the reliability of the New Testament. That's a red herring. The question that he stated at the beginning, what must a person do to believe? That's the question. So I'm not going to address the fact that the Quran nowhere accuses the Bible of being changed. It accuses Christians of lying about the Bible. It accuses Christians of distorting the Bible. But the, the Quran itself actually calls Christians to live by the gospel and calls Jews to live by the Old Testament. So the Quran doesn't believe in a changed Bible. And we know what the Bible looked like in the seventh century. However, that's a red herring because that's not the debate. The debate is not all these Jesus's words. The debate is what must we believe to be saved? And I'm appealing to my authority. He's disputing my authority. He's disputing what it says. He's saying that it doesn't say what it says. However, Jesus states, Jesus states that, that but, but let's come to what the apostles teach. And I, I want him to address what the apostles teach because I've rejected the premise that we shouldn't look at the apostles. The apostles are very clear that Christ's blood is shed for the forgiveness of sins. So my question to you is, you're saying that this isn't what Jesus taught, but that doesn't address the fact that this is not how Christianity works. So be an honest interlocutor, deal with Christianity properly, and if you're not willing to, then I challenge you again, show me in the Quran where Jesus says that he is the Messiah. Don't appeal to the Hadiths, I don't believe in your Hadiths. Don't appeal to the fact that you've got these Hadiths that were written centuries later, after Muhammad died, that were not ever established, you know, Muhammad doesn't give you any criterion to choose which scholars. There's nothing in the Quran that you can use to justify that. If you're going to make an argument, at least be honest. If Jesus is saying that he is going to suffer and die, and the Old Testament is saying that the Son of Man must suffer and die, why? Tell me why is that necessary? The apostles say it is because of the salvation that is given from it. That's what the apostles teach. That's what Christianity teaches. And all I've heard is, you say that, well, you know, where does Jesus say that? But you've ignored completely, that's not how Christianity works. And when I reverse that same argument on you, you say, no, 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 I can appeal to hadiths. If you can appeal to hadiths, I can appeal to the apostles. If you're not willing to accept the apostles, I'm not willing to accept the hadiths. And I challenge you again, show me where in the Quran, Jesus says, I am the Messiah. I want to hear that. And you said, we well, have got Allah's words, they're superior. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Allah says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Who's the first and the last? Jesus or Allah? Three minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, just realize how we just completely shifted and changed like, the, entire, the entire subject at hand. I, the, the question I asked, to, to, be more, to be more specific in the beginning, was what is required for an individual within Christian uh, theology to believe in to attain paradise? That was my question, correct? Um, so I'm asking this question, I'm asking this question as a Muslim. So I have certain authorities that, so we, we both as Christians and Muslims have certain authorities that we agree upon. Um, we have Jesus, whom, whom, whom I believe is an infallible, you believe he's an infallible as well, and even more than that. And even Simon and Peter, you, you're actually speaking to a Shia Muslim. I can help you guys even more. Sunnis don't accept like uh, Jesus having an, an, a, a successor of him. I, I'm, I'm literally giving you guys an extra guy to, to you know, help yourself. And you can't even find statements from him. So the point being is that you can't compare the apostles with the Sunnah. The Sunnah is the, are the literal sayings of the prophets, and the apostles are dudes who just come up out of the blue like Paul and, and, he, and he basically just comes up with stuff. Jesus didn't point towards him. The prophet, he said, Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati al 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 -mahdina min ba'di. Which means that you must follow my sunnah, my tradition and the tradition of the caliphs that will come after me. So he's pointing towards individuals. He's saying that my sunnah is also, my, my traditions is also an example for you. 
Show me where Jesus says, Paul is an example for you. He doesn't say that. Muhammad does, does, does point towards his sunnah. The Quran points towards his sunnah. For example, ma'atakum al-rasoolu fa'khuduh wa ma'anahakum anhu fantahu Which means that whatever the Prophet comes with, take, take that. And whatever he, he, he tells you to, to abstain from, abstain from it. There's a clear allusion or it, it, it clearly alludes towards the principle of taking from the Prophet's sunnah, from his uh, tradition. But you can't show me that as a Christian, that when the Prophet, uh, when, when Jesus, upon whom be peace, says, follow Paul, for example, or, f or follow, uh, you know, um, you know, what's his name, uh, Philip, or, or any of the, those dudes. He, he doesn't. But he does say about Simon and Peter, he will be my rock and bowl, but even in the Bible it says that. So C Catholics will tell you that the first successor of uh, Jesus was Simon and Peter. We as Shias actually believe that. So, so, so there are commonalities even within Christianity and Islam, Shia Islam, let's be more specific. But show me, right? And, and, and you basically fail to do that. He quoted a verse from the Old Testament, which, which shows about how the Messiah will come and he will, you know, um, assist uh, the people. If you, if you also bring it out, please, then uh, if, if you can bring it out, then you can also address it. Because I, I've actually forgotten to, to address that verse. And let's see if it helps you or not. You done? I'm, I'm finished. Okay, so again, like him, him, him trying to uh, attack Paul. We Christians love Paul. We embrace everything that Paul says. There's not a problem for us with embracing Paul. And, and the reality is just, again, I, I notice he didn't show me where in the Quran Jesus said that he was the Messiah. He just, but he says that it's okay for him to appeal to the Sunnah, but it's not okay for me to appeal to the apostles. This is ridiculous. Christ himself said to Peter, Peter, upon this rock, I shall build my church. Well, was Peter acting alone? No, he had other apostles. And those apostles embraced Paul as an apostle. Amen. We see that in the book of Acts, where Paul goes up to Jerusalem to check if he was preaching the same gospel as the other apostles, or whether his preaching was in vain. And as he says in his letters, they reached out the hand of fellowship to me. So the brother doesn't understand how Christianity works and he's working to a double standard. But I want him to understand that the Old Testament prophets talked about a suffering servant. And Mark, most of all, from chapters eight to 16, talks about the suffering servant. And Mark was the, the, the collected teachings of Saint Peter. Amen. Peter was the one who is the, uh, behind the writing of the Gospel of Mark. We know this from church tradition, we know this from church history. So simply saying, well, who's this Paul? Doesn't matter. Jesus Christ appeared to Paul. Jesus Christ inspired Paul to be an apostle. Paul preached the gospel. Paul went to the other apostles and the other apostles embraced him as an apostle. That is enough for us as Christians. That is enough. And it is no good saying, I can appeal to the sooner, but you can't appeal to the apostles. I want you to engage with what it says in scripture. Why does the scripture speak about a suffering servant in Isaiah 52? Why does it talk about uh, uh, a suffering servant? Bear with me. He was despised, sorry, Isaiah 53. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and one like from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken. May I continue because my time's going to run out. Smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. Why are the prophets of Israel saying that the Messiah would be pierced through for the transgressions of Israel? I want you to answer that question. I don't want you to avoid it. I don't want you to say, well, we don't believe in the pro uh, apostles. I don't care. We believe in the apostles. Muhammad, Muhammad is nothing compared to Paul. And his sooner is nothing compared to the apostolic teaching. So I want you to tell me why we Christians, oh, am, I, am I still on time? Uh, you're about 10 seconds off. Right. That's fine, you can continue. No. You can reply. Okay, so let's, let's see the verse. Okay. So, before I actually address the verse, he, he, actually, he basically talked about how uh, Jesus appeared to Paul, right? Um, who claims that? 
Paul himself does. Who, who else claims that? Luke. Stuck Where? In the cave, man. In the Book of Acts. Paul didn't write at Luke. No, no, Paul didn't write Acts. No, no. It's a good question, by the way. Send it to Laughter. Paul didn't write Acts. Well, can you show me any evidence that, that there, there was, there was the, 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 same, the same gospel writer that... that, that yes, okay. I can. Okay. Yes, I can. good question, okay. but save it to Laughter. This bro, is bro, bro, it's all right. Okay. Just... So, so people heckle. The it's all right, bro. Okay. okay. So, the point being is, the one who actually claims that, I mean, as far as I know, I can obviously be corrected, but, but, but as far as I know, the, the, the one who actually claims to be, uh, to, to have seen Jesus and got the shining light was Paul, right? So, so, so the problem is that this is a circular argument because we are relying on Paul to conclude that he saw Jesus. We'll show, we'll, we'll show me basically... Um, Your three minutes. Yeah, show, show it to me, I'm, I'm just cut it off. Yeah, 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 we'll pause it. Yeah. So let me just address the point. He said it. He said that we're relying on Paul to say that Paul, that we're relying on Paul for the claim that Paul saw Jesus. That's factually false. We're relying on the writings of Luke Amen. and the writings of Paul that were written at different times in different places by different authors. Paul says in his letters, I saw Jesus. Luke says in his writings, Paul saw Jesus. And how do we know it was Luke? Because Luke says, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Look at the beginning of Luke. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of these things accomplished amongst us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it in account, consecutive order, most excellent, Theophilus. So Luke writes Acts and he writes the Gospel. We are not dependent upon Paul for Paul's visionary experience of Jesus. We have two witnesses, Luke and Paul. No, we paused it for you. Okay, there you go. Okay, look, let me specify my claim. My claim was, was about eyewitnesses. So I'm, I'm talking about individuals that saw this. I'm not, I'm not saying like, I mean, you can, you can go to any church and they'll tell you, yeah, I mean, you yourself will attest to Paul seeing Jesus. I don't care, like, this, this is not the issue at hand. I'm, I'm talking about eyewitnesses, individuals who claim to be eyewitnesses, not, you know... Um, claims here and there. You can claim anything you want, but... but are, are there actual eyewitnesses? That was my question, to be more specific. Okay. I, I don't want to interrupt you. No, no, Stop my time from three minutes. Right, so guys, we've got him bang to rights now. Bang to rights, this guy is blown out of the park. Why? I'll tell you why. Because he said he wanted to hear from words, the words of Jesus. This is Jesus speaking. After the resurrection, he says, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. Jesus said it himself, post the resurrection in Luke chapter 24. Now, he wants to change the framework of our discussion. I am not interested. If he wanted to discuss the reliability of the Gospels, he should have said that at the beginning. What he said he wanted to talk about was what must a person do to be saved. And I can therefore appeal to my authorities. I don't have to justify my authorities because he said, what in Christianity must a person do to be saved? I don't have to justify them to make my argument. I just have to show that they're there. If he wants to debate reliability, he should have said that at the beginning, not change the subject because he's losing. Now notice, the whole time I have just been absorbing his criticism about what a person must do to be saved from Christianity. I haven't yet even begun to criticize Islam. So what I'm gonna do now, because he's, he's not dealing with the verses, I want him to, I'll come back to Isaiah 53 and I want now that we've got it from Jesus' own lips that the Christ must suffer and die I want him to address why the prophets teach what the prophets actually teach about that suffering and dying it says he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he did not open sorry let me come back up here surely can I read this whole passage can we pause? Am I alright to pause with your consent? 
So this is what the prophets say about the suffering Messiah. They say this, He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and like one whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us turning away, turning his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. So Jesus says, the Christ must suffer and die on the third day. And the prophets say, the Christ must suffer for the iniquities of the world. Do you now agree? that Christ teaches that he must die and suffer for the iniquities of the world. And if not, show me biblically why not. Three minutes. Um, okay, fair enough. So... Do you agree? No, I don't. Um, well, because... Well, I mean, no, no, I'll, I'll explain why I don't agree. Okay, from the Bible. Yeah. Um, you're quoting the Old Testament. I can just go to my Jewish cousins and they'll tell you you're full of it, okay? So, yeah, literally. Because this verse is, I mean, as far as I recall, within Jewish theology, it's talking about how when the Jews were kicked out of uh, Egypt or wherever it was. Look, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not, well, I'm not a well verse I'm, I'm a Judaism. But, but the point being is, they had basically committed some sins and it's talking about how, how this is a, like a metaphorical representation of an individual that will um, come after, um, that will basically in enable the, the repentance for that specific sin. So no Jew believes that some, some Messiah will come that will cleanse all of their, you know, all of their sins and this idea of, um, of, of inheriting seminally the sin of Adam, which is, which is why you get baptized and all these things, right? No Jew believes in that. So your interpretation, that's, that's fair. You can, you can believe in your fairy tale. But, but Jews will disagree with you, okay? Because, and, and, and it's in fact their scripture. So quoting the Isaiah is not going to help you. They don't believe in, in what you believe in. So like, it's just ridiculous. You know, I'm, 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 I'm making a very, very simple and straightforward thing, which is that you guys believe in Jesus. You're called Christians, Christians, right? So show me from the teaching of Jesus. And you fail to do that. Right, and, and and even that part where where where, where basically Jesus in, in the Gospel of Luke uh, says that I that I will die and rise on the third day. Okay, that's that that is an incident that happens in the Bible. Jesus also caused Pharisees, as I mentioned before, all sorts of things. Do I have to believe that Jesus said X, Y, Z to the Pharisees to basically be redeemed? No, that incident is very very particular. So. Therefore, Jesus should also highlight that this incident is very particular by saying that, guys, I'm going to die for your sins and you have to believe in that to be saved. Why the hell do I have to rely on, on someone else for that? That doesn't make any sense. And, and also this idea of, of uh, verifying Paul. No, Luke, the, who also wrote Acts and whatever, was, was uh, Luke an, an eyewitness? That was my, I mean, to, to basically specify my claim. Bring me multiple eyewitnesses that said that Paul saw Jesus. It's just Paul himself that claims that. It's just Paul himself that came to it. Okay? So, um, so Paul is, you know, he means nothing. He's just a. So, I see the liar. Do you guys, do you guys believe that he's. He's, he's, he's a big man. God bless you. Thank you very much. Ten, uh, 30 I'm, seconds I'm, I'm left. Okay, so did you all hear him say, oh, the Jews won't believe that? Well, I'm just pointing out that the Jews don't believe that Muhammad's in the Bible either. But do Muslims accept no, no the test? Don't interrupt. Sorry, I didn't interrupt sorry, you. Sorry. No, right. So, so when, when the Jews don't accept Christian teaching, they're an authority. When Jews don't accept Muslim teaching, suddenly they don't know what they're talking about. Muslims try to show Muhammad in the Bible all the time. Jews don't accept that, but the Jews are wrong. Let's just be clear about something. The New Testament 
from beginning to end is a Jewish document. It was written and authored by Jews. Matthew was a Jew, John was a Jew, Luke was a disciple of Jew, Mark was a disciple of Jews, Paul was a Jew. They were all Jews. And furthermore, appealing to the Jews of today is essentially appealing to the Jews of the fifth century. They're Talmudic Jews. The Judaism that emerged after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD is the rabbinic Judaism of the Pharisees. But as evidenced by the New Testament, the Pharisees were just one group amongst many groups. The Herodians, the Sadducees, the Christians. Were the, original, the first Christians were all Jews. So this was an internal discussion within Judaism. And I'm going to demonstrate how ignorant he is about Second Temple Judaism. Because in Second Temple Judaism, they have literature talking about the Son of Man as being a divine figure. Now I can't remember, I, well, I want to say, I want to say Melchizedek, no, it's not Melchizedek, what is it? The one that's quoted in uh, the letters of Paul, but it's not in scripture. Oh. Enoch. Enoch, Enoch, thank you. I think it's in Enoch. In Enoch, it talks about the Son of Man being a divine figure. That Second Temple Jewish literature from the first century that isn't Christian, that says that the Son of Man is divine, showing that Jews in the first century, there were Jews in the first century who believed that the Son of Man was divine. He's appealing to 5th century Jews that reject the idea of Muhammad being a prophet. Now, the fact of the matter is, in Isaiah 53, Peter, who was a Jew, who, who was behind the writing of the Gospel of Mark, Mark quotes the book of Isaiah and the prophecies in Isaiah to make the case from chapters 18 to 15 that Jesus Christ is the suffering servant. He just does not know the literature he's trying to argue with. And he doesn't know the history in which it was born either. Right, so when I, when I was referring to the Jews, I was just saying that, there's, that there are nuances within your own understanding of the actual uh, Old Testament. So your interpretation isn't some kind of, you know, on a pedestal. You're just one out of the, you know, a bunch of uh, whatever, you want to call them, right? Yeah, I mean, who are you guys? <laughs> there, are, there are basically a bunch of interpretations involved. Why is your, why is your understanding superior to the ones of, of the 5th century Jews? By the way, as, as Muslims, we believe that yes, it was very early on that, Jew, that Jesus was deified. <laughs> we don't dispute that. It's not, it's not some kind of, oh, gotcha kind of thing. Right? It's, it's just, I mean, the, the funny thing is that you're mentioning things that I generally don't, don't, don't like dispute. Like, I, I don't have an issue with, with, you know, the second temple, the Jews understanding, whatever. They are kafar, they are disbelievers in, in our view. Sure, they had that view of a, of, a, of a human being being deified. So what? There are people who believe that, you know, Tupac is still alive today. I don't care, man. Like, like who, who are these individuals that, that have um, beliefs? You know, that they can, anyone, anyone can bring any beliefs. I'm, I'm saying we need to go back to the roots, right? This is actually what the Quran also does a lot. You know, how can Ibrahim was Hudan al Nasara were Abraham and his two sons, uh, Isaac and Ishmael? Did they ever call themselves Christians? Did they ever call themselves Jews? They, they, they always refer to themselves as individuals who submitted to God. So, 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 this is the kind of mentality I'm, I'm, I'm trying to have people refer back to. We, we want to go back to the original source, Jesus, right? Thank you. So, does Jesus actually support your beliefs? Okay, in your Gospels, you have, you have him, for example, pro prophesizing that he will die and, 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 um, um, raise, uh, and, and be raised on... Oh my God. And be raised on the third day. I'm, 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 like, I, I lag quite a lot when I talk. It's a bit annoying. But anyways, the, the point being is that he did prophesy that in the Gospels. Fine, let's just accept that. But it doesn't help you because there are lots of incidents in the Bible which are not necessary for an, indiv for an individual to believe in to, to reach, uh, you know, uh, paradise. So, so as an example of the Pharisees where he cursed the trees, do I have to believe that Jesus cursed the tree to, 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 to reach paradise? No, no, I don't. <laughs> there are lots of incidents in the Bible. So what makes this in incident... Uh, uh, yeah. What, so what, what makes this incident so, so specific? And you can't use the Old Testament because, because there are multiple interpretations. What makes your interpretation 
um, the, the, the true one. Again, because you'll find other people who, who don't agree with you. And even within the New Testament, they don't find anything specific where Jesus points towards a certain list of beliefs, sorry, a certain list of beliefs that an individual must uh, adhere to to attain paradise. 15. Uh, I'm done. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'll show you yet more proof. And I'm just wondering at, how, at what point the penny will drop that his argument is busted. Listen to Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, reading from verse 27. He said he wants it explicit. I don't think we can have any more explicit than this. Jesus speaking, he says, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. It says it, Jesus says it, bro. Now will you accept that you are wrong? That Jesus does say that his death is for salvation, that his blood of the new covenant is for salvation. And what else does Jesus say? Uh, no. What else does Jesus say? Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. All. All of it. All of it. Jesus. What human being can say that? None. Can Muhammad say that? No. Can any of you say that? No. Can he say that? No. Can I say that? Never. Jesus said it. Amen. Then he goes on to say, go therefore and make all disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Hallelujah. So Jesus is saying, teach people to believe that my blood is shed for the forgiveness of sins. He said, go and make disciples, teaching them to observe what I have commanded you. He commanded us to break bread and to share the cup of wine in remembrance that his blood was shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. Thanks be to God. And the prophets in the Old Testament say that the Messiah will suffer for the forgiveness of sins. He says, who are you? Who are you? I'll tell you who we are. We are the church founded on the apostles. Amen. The apostles who walked with the Jesus, the apostles who knew Jesus, the apostles who inspired the writings of the New Testament by the grace and gift of the Holy Spirit. And we are their inheritors. They were Jews. Jews arguing with Jews means that we just pick a side and we agree with the Jews who were the apostles. By contrast, who's Muhammad? He's some 600 years too late. 1,000 plus miles away too far, guy who didn't know a thing about Jesus and tried to claim something that's untrue, that Jesus was not crucified. Everybody. Okay, so can you, can you please go back to the verse where you closed it? Yep. Can, do you want me to hold the Bible? No, or? I will hold my Bible. Okay. Enough. It's this one. Yeah, so he, he closed it from this verse, okay. Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Okay. So What does that mean? Well, I'm going to explain it right now. Okay. So he's, again, I mean, we both understand English and it's, it's in clear English. And it, it, it basically says that this wine, which, which will be poured out for you, will be used to, for, um, for, which will be poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Yeah. My blood. Blood. The blood here is synonymous with uh, with the wine. So, he, so he's not saying, yeah, it is, it's very clear, look, look. It says, drink from it, which means the wine. Not, uh, you know, the I'm gonna cut, you know, here, drink from, you know, it's not, it's not a vampire series, darling. But anyways, uh, the, the point being is that he's, he's literally making his blood synonymous with the wine. So he's saying that, that the wine would be used to, to basically we cause uh, your forgiveness. So. How does that help you in any way, shape or form? It doesn't. Okay, bring, bring the other verse that you quote, please. Um, go there and baptize the... Actually, this is also very interesting because there was, there was, a, there was a, a, a church father, whenever he quoted this verse, he, he, would, always, he would always say, go and baptize... Sorry? 130. Yeah. Uh, he, 
he would always go out and um, and mention go and baptize in the name of the Father or the Son. Like like the the, the whole idea of, of all the three being mentioned at once wasn't mentioned by him. I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to quote, quote quote to you. It was, it was one of the church fathers. But but that's besides the point because our discussion about salvation. This like well. Where the hell does that say anything about um, about you know having to believe that he died for your sins? It doesn't say that. All authority. Okay, so all. Oh, okay, this is very cool. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. We we actually believe that as a Shia Muslim, I believe that. I, I believe that Jesus has something we call Wilayat Aquinia, which means he has control of the entire universe. We believe that as a Shia Muslim. So this is no, this is nothing you know controversial. This is divine. No, 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 no. Uh, you guys are like the uh, the Ahlul You're using up your time to answer a question from the crowd. Don't do that. Sorry. Are you done? Yeah, I'm done. I mean, this is okay. nothing. Okay. So, guys, what, what what we heard is he he said that he he admits that when Christ says this is my blood, that he's making the wine synonymous with his blood. Amen. Brilliant. So Christ dies on the cross. His blood is shed for the forgiveness of the world. Mm. That's what we've just established, and the wine is a symbol of that. The wine is the embodiment of that. There's dispute amongst Christians whether we should understand it literally or metaphorically, but all Christians universally agree that, 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 that the, the Eucharistic meal is in remembrance, even them that take it as the actual body and blood, is in remembrance of Christ's suffering on the cross. And why did Christ suffer on the cross according to Christ? For the forgiveness of sins. Thanks be to God. Why did Christ suffer on the cross according to Isaiah? For the forgiveness of sins. Now please note, I've at no point even bothered to attack Islam. Do you know why? Because there's no salvation in Islam. It's true. I'm not even bothered to attack Islam because I don't see any salvation in Islam and so it's not worth me attacking it. But let's be clear. But let's be clear, the brother has not been able to make an argument that knocks down the clear evidence that the apostles teach Christ's blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins, that Christ taught that his blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins, and that the prophets taught that the Messiah would suffer for the forgiveness of sins. So we have the prophets saying it, we have Christ himself saying it, and we have the apostles saying it. I don't know how much clear it, it can be. He says, oh, it's talking about the wine. Yes, it's talking about the wine. And he's saying that the wine has a relationship to the blood. In what way? That as the wine is poured out, the blood is poured out. And why? For the forgiveness of sins. Now, I found it interesting that he just said that as a Shia, he believes that Jesus Christ has control of the universe. Very good. Now, I'll be honest, I've never heard that before. No. And I'm really interested to investigate that idea. Likewise. But we Christians, if he's not willing to say that Jesus is God, then as a Christian, I want to say that the Shia are polytheists. Because he has just created an equality between Jesus Christ and God. And that is blasphemy unless Jesus Christ is God. Sure. Because only God has control of the universe. Mm. Only God has authority over the universe. And he just said Jesus Christ, as a Shia he believes, Jesus Christ has authority over the universe, which makes him a polytheist unless he is willing to agree that Jesus Christ is God. Uh, it, makes it makes sense. 15 seconds. You go, Bob? I, I would like him to, I'd like him to, to answer that. Um, I can definitely have a discussion on Shia theology. I mean, just to, to short mention this idea, uh, his control of the universe is by the permission of God. So it's, so it's like you have a hierarchy. So God permits him to have that control of the universe. It doesn't mean that he's God by any fault, by any long shot. The universe is, is a mere dust of the creation of God. Well, like, what the hell is this? I mean, are you guys that simplistic? Have you never heard of the multiverse theorem? Have you never heard of how, how great the creation of God is? Like, just, just, just to have control of, of, of uh, the observable universe or that which we, which we realize exists. You know, for, for God to give a prophet that, you know, that, uh, that ability. It's, it's nothing. The universe is nothing. It is just a speckle from, the, from amongst the creation of God. So let's, let's, let's just, you know, be a bit more modernized because, you know, we, we've actually got science and we've, we've actually advanced ourselves. The universe is nothing in, 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 terms, of, in terms of the entire creation. So it's, it's not shirk by any, you know, long shots. We, the, the Quran says that Jesus creates. 
The Quran says that Jesus is, is a creator. Why and how? By the will of, of the creator. Right? So, so he creates, yeah. He actually says, إِنِّي أَخْلُقُ لَكُمْ مِنَ الطَّيْنِ كَيَّةِ الطَّيْرِ فَأَنْفُقُ فِيهِ فَيْكُنُ الطَّيْرِ بِذْنًا I create to you from clay a bird. He says, I, I create. So, we, 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 it's not a problem. But, he, but then he says, بِإِذْنِ الله, By the permission of God. Why didn't Muhammad right? have a good day? God bless you. He did. Bless you, bro. But, 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 Thank you for coming. Sorry. Sorry. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not debating you. So, so, so the point being is... Um, 1.30. Yeah. So, if you, if you could... Actually, I, I've, I've, I've memorized it. The verse is very clear. It's talking about how through drinking that wine, you, you'll be forgiven. So, when, when, Jesus was, <laughs> when Jesus was on the cross, but people sucking uh, his, his blood out. Is that what you guys are saying? Are you guys, are you guys, are you guys hearing what you're saying? So his blood in, in that verse was, he was basically making blood, his blood equal to, um, to the wine. He, 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 was, he was using it as, as a kind of like a synonymous you know, expression that I will give you my, my blood, meaning the wine, right? So do you, do you guys believe that for people to basically reach salvation, they have to go to, 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 to Jesus when he's on the cross and suck his blood from him? To, 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 you know, be forgiven. The verse is very clear in this. It says that I will give you the wine and, and when you drink it, you'll be forgiven. That's what, that's what the verse says. Yeah, I know I'm correct. <laughs> I know I am, right? You've got 30 seconds left, still want to use them? Ah, oh, it's just kick man. <laughs> so, so basically what, what we heard was now no Christian would ever perform the blasphemy we, that we have just heard here. The, the blasphemy of the Shia Muslim. I'm shocked. I'm shocked because I'm so used to talking to Sunni Muslims who are so desperate to try and guard their sense of the oneness of God. That, that I'm genuinely shocked that a Shia is saying that, that Jesus Christ creates. Jesus Christ creates. So that, that, that Jesus Christ has a divine attribute and that he shares the authority of God over the universe. This is blasphemy unless you say Jesus Christ is God. We Christians would never utter such a blasphemous thing as to ascribe to a mere and only a man such divine attributes. We say that Jesus Christ is divine and therefore he can say rightly that all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Why given? Because he has a human nature and that human nature inherits the titles and the the authorities of the divine nature and that's why he speaks in terms of inheritance but the reason why that divine nature can say that the words of Jesus can say I have received all authority in heaven and earth is because his divinity has it already it's there with him already there's only one God and if you say that there are others apart from God that have divine attributes, but you won't say that those others are the same God, you are by definition a polytheist. No Christian would utter that blasphemy. And, and I find myself in a really peculiar position of being in a position where I can invite a Muslim to embrace monotheism, <laughs> which is so not something that I would ever be able to do with a Sunni because they do believe in one God. Now, coming back to the topic, He's right, Christ makes his blood and the wine synonymous. But his blood is being shed for the forgiveness of the world. Now, he mocks it in some cartoon characterization, which I think is very dishonest for an intellectual debate, that it means that we're up there sucking at the cross. Like that kind of childish characterization doesn't deal with what we're talking about. Christ mystically, I believe personally, is present in that blood wine. His blood is present, really, truly, in that wine, and I receive it into myself. And I believe it because Christ said it, and that is enough for me. He said, my body is, in the Gospel of John, my body is real food, and my blood is real drink. Unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you will have no life in you. That's what Jesus said. That is what we believe. Why? Because of what happened at the cross. And I haven't seen any biblical argument to say I'm wrong. Uh, so just a comment on this. It's quite funny that a Christian, that was my monotheism. A, an individual who deifies a man calls me a, calls me a polytheist. We are not simplistic human beings who think that the universe is everything. 
The universe, as I told you, is a mere spectacle of the creation of God. So for God to enable a human being to have control over these things, like, what, like, what, like okay, so what? So what? And in fact, we also have a verse in the Quran where God says, Tabarakallahu ahsanul khaliqeen, which means glory be upon God, the best of creators, which means that there are multiple creators. But why, why is God the best of creators? Because He is the one who enables everyone else to create. It is through His will alone. Because God creates by His own will and from nothing. When Jesus creates, He creates from other things. From creation, He, he, he can create. So, and, and we also, by the way, have an authentic report from our eighth Imam, Ali ibn Musa Rida, where he says that creation and, um, and you know, blessings, like, like you know, when God blesses His creation, all, all of that is, is from God alone. But a, um, a creation can create and can bless through other blessings or through other creations. That's how it works. So there's a hierarchy. It's not that you know Jesus can create by his own will. No one, no one says that. And you, and you don't understand Islamic theology talking about polytheism and monotheism, right? So that's, that, that's also ridiculous. But I'm not. And to go back on the on the wine thing, I'm I'm not trying to insult you guys. Thank you. I'm not. I'm not trying to insult uh, your your beliefs, by the way. But it's it's just because when when you read the verse, like. In a in a literal surface, oh my god! In a in a literal surface-based understanding, the um, the verse literally says that through this wine, through drinking it, your sins will be forgiven. So I'm saying, if you are taking the wine and the blood to be literal synonymities, meaning that when when Jesus is on the cross and he, and his blood is pouring, is someone going to take a cup and be like, yeah, I'm going to get some drops here, all right? So I'm going to drink it to for, for my sins to be forgiven. No one understands it that way, right? It's, it's ridiculous. The verse actually says that the wine will um, will cleanse your sins. Doesn't it say that? So that's my what criticism. The, what, may I reply? Of course. What the scriptures... Oh, three minutes? Yep. You alright with that? What the scriptures say is that Christ's suffering redeems us from our sins. That's what the scriptures say. Fully and completely. And when we're baptised, we enter into the body of Christ. Mm. And by that mystical union with our body to the body of Christ, because he has conquered death, we have eternal life in us. That's how it works in the Christian paradigm. Outside of that body, there is no salvation. Extra ecclesiam nulla salus. Outside of the body of Christ, there is no salvation. Because if you are outside of the body of Christ, you are outside of eternal life itself. The one who conquers death is the one whose body we are joined to through baptism. We are risen because he is risen. We are declared clean because he is sinless. We receive of his blood and it washes away our sins. Now we've done it to death. He's seen it. Christ said it explicitly. He just has to wrestle with that truth. But the point is, if we are to, Im to be immersed in that body, that body, what is it? How do we identify it? That body is the body of Christ. Those disciples who make Jesus their Lord and their master and they follow in him. Sorry, we're having a debate. It's timed. So in terms of, in terms of, this body, we, we identify it as those who follow Jesus Christ, as their Lord and as their Saviour. We don't look to save ourselves. Why? Because we cannot save ourselves. Why? I'll tell you why. God created you and you owe God your life. But because of your sinful nature, you will never give God the whole of your thoughts. You will never give God the whole of your words. You will never give God the whole of your actions. And so you have fallen short of that expectation. You have failed to give back to God what he has given to you. And so now there is a debt, a debt of life that must be paid. And so that debt you can't pay yourselves because you're not good enough to pay for the sins of the world. But Jesus Christ, who was sinless and whose human life is valued by the divinity that it is joined to, 
gives that life infinite value so that his life can pay for all of our lives. Amen. Spotless lamb of God. Three minutes, ready? Yeah. Um, just have to ignore the list lady. She's obviously not well. Just just keep going. Just keep going. Um, so in terms of the first statement of uh, that, that, that Bob uh, brought up, which is that the, um, which is that the, uh, what's it called? The scripture points towards that Jesus died for our sins. I don't, I don't deny that. Yeah, but we, we agree. We there agree. we go. We agree. Okay, Finally. Yeah, well, 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 really. Allah Akbar. Must see Allah Akbar. Yeah. Whatever. But, but, but the point being is you're too lost. That I'm just ignore this lady. That I'm referring to the, the teachings of Jesus. So apostles, can we just You are not speaking to God. No, she'll just follow us. You, you just got to ignore her. She'll get. She'll, yeah. If you ignore her, she'll go away. Yeah. Don't give them so, the so the apostles know. and the prophets within here, within like writings of, of the New Testament. Do you affirm that very clearly? I don't deny that at all. But speak for yourself. You got to keep going. Being silly. But the point no is, going. 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 I've done it for six years, so I'm used to it. Just, just press on, bro. Just press on. I'm listening. I'm listening to you. Talk to me. Talk to me. Ignore her. Talk to me. But the point being is, as a Muslim, I take this. Pause his time. Pause his time. God is one. No, sister, no one, no one is wanting to talk to you. No, but why not? Okay, so guys, are you, are you here? Are guys, you on camera? I am playing a game. We're not talking to I mean, you. We're having a conversation. What kind of game is that you well, play? No one is interested in talking to you. You're being oh, very yes. rude. Look, I'm here. Right. Kill me. No one's going to kill, kill you. Kill me. Stop being silly. Right. Right. Let's let's walk to the other side of that crowd. Oh, bro, 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 come this way. Come this way. So try again. Yeah. Try again. Yeah. So, so, as I previously mentioned, form a tight circle, guys. Shoulder to shoulder, form a tight circle. Go on. So, as I previously mentioned, that when Bob says that the scripture, generally speaking, like as a as a general statement, refers um, or directly references that Jesus will die for sins, that He's the Lord, the Savior, and so on. I don't dispute that. There are many apostles, and even individuals during the time of Jesus that call Jesus God. I don't, I don't deny that. Those are all factual things within the Bible. That is, that is, that is something which is true. But, but my problem, because I'm coming from an Islamic you know, perspective on this, and I have certain individuals who I revere, and whom we both revere. Jesus, and you know, for me as a Shia, uh, Simon and... Oh my God, I'll, I'll ignore that. Uh, Simon uh, slash Peter, because Jesus actually gave him that type of Peter. Peter means the boulder, right? The rock, the one who, 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 who basically, uh, uh, you know, the rock where, where the church will be built upon. So I don't, I mean, the wordings I might dispute, but, but with the principle, this idea that you have Jesus as the main figure and Simon Peter being his successor, uh, this is something I believe in. But I've, I've yet to see, I mean, based on my opinion, obviously, Bob will dispute that, but based on my opinion, I've yet to see clear verses from the Bible where, where Jesus says that one must believe in these things, or, or even from his, you know, Simon and Peter, saying that one must believe in them, in the death of, uh, in the death and, and, and resurrection to be saved, and that he's, that he's our Lord and Savior. Thank you. So, it's just because within, within the Islamic fr uh, framework, we have, we have, like a very basic and simple kind of list of these things. It's mentioned in the Quran, it's mentioned in the Sunnah, and those are all intertwined. So it's like a chain-based, like, uh, you know, argumentation. So the Quran says something, the Sunnah um, refers to it. But, but in the Bible, I, I have to believe in individuals who Jesus never met. And obviously, you, you claim that Paul, G Jesus met. Sorry, your time's up, I'll give you a few more seconds. Thank you. Uh, so, so for example, this idea of that, okay, Paul is a very important figure and Christians revere him, respect him and so on. I accept that, but there are no other eyewitnesses who claim that Jesus, that he was seen by Jesus. The only one who claims this is Paul himself, which makes it a very cyclical argument. Even, even when I have debates with my Sunni brothers and sisters about Aisha, for example, like... This can, is, I, can I reply? No, this is a comparison. Just let him just yeah, All right, right. This is a comparison. For example, they, they'll tell you, Aisha, she's just. I'll say, I'll say how? You say, well, well, the Prophet prayed for her. I'll say, well, uh, who narrates that narration? Well, Aisha does. Well, that's very convenient, isn't it? So it's the same thing with Paul here. It's very, very, the logic is very similar. Who narrates that, uh, that, that, you know, who says that I saw this? Paul himself says that. But why do I have to take Paul as an authority? Can I reply? Yeah. So firstly, I mean, we already dealt with this point earlier. I demonstrated that Luke also talked about Christ seeing, uh, Paul seeing Christ. 
And he's obviously not taken that on board. And I demonstrated that quite plainly from the book of Acts and Luke's own gospel. Um, the reality is, guys, we love Paul. Amen. It does not matter to me if you say that it's built on Paul's teaching. I will say, amen, I agree, fantastic, we love Paul, brilliant. So what that you don't like Paul? I accept Paul's teaching. That's the end of the debate on that one, guys. And what I think is really wonderful is if, is if Muslims agree with Christians that our teachings come from Paul, then that means we all agree that we've got the original teachings. Amen. And they haven't been changed. No, they Brilliant. So now will the Muslims agree with us that our scriptures have not been changed because our scriptures were written from Paul. Brilliant. And that means they've not been changed because we love Paul, we accept Paul, and they're saying you've got your teachings from Paul. Less Great. Impossible. No changed New Testament. Now we can throw all that argument about you can't trust the Bible in the bin. Now, the reality is, please know, at no point have I bothered to attack Islam. Why? Because there's no salvation in Islam. So there's no need to debate whether you can be saved in Islam. He says, show me a list of things of what to believe in the Bible. Well, this is utter rubbish. The reality is that Muslims believe lots of things that they draw out from different verses of the Quran and in a secondary movement from those verses, they then say, we believe these things. Okay, show me in the Quran where it says, pray five times a day. I don't want you to pull different verses out. I want you to show me a verse where it says, pray five times a day. Show me in the verse in the Quran where it gives you the formula of the Shahada. I don't want you to use two verses and pull it together. And I don't accept your hadiths. They were written hundreds of years later by chains of witnesses I don't trust. I don't, I'm not interested, I want to see it in the Quran. But the thing is, he won't agree to apply to his own religion the principles that he's asking me to apply to mine. And so I don't need to accept his argument that I need to show him a list. What I need to do is point by point to show where the scriptures teach something, we affirm it, and then as a secondary movement, we can put that in a list. And the scriptures teach that Christ was crucified. How long have I got time? About 15 seconds. Finally, the Quran claims that Christ was not crucified. That's factually false. It's a historical error in the Quran. And thus, it's a very clear disproof that Islam is false and Christianity is true. Amen. Three minutes? Yes, please. Um, so, I am very specific in my, like, when I, whenever I'm, I make a claim, because I'm, I'm, I'm like very into philosophy and theology, so I really like to be very, like, spe specifically my, my theological brain is very uh, inclined towards wanting to make very specific claims. So, when, so when, when I, for example, uh, talk about Paul, I'm talking about eyewitnesses. So, was, was Luke an eyewitness? No. The only one who was present and, um, and who we know of in that incident, obviously he was, he was on his way to persecute Christians when this happened, per, per his claim, right? So, yeah, I mean, this is, this is, this is what I was like, learned back, back in school, it could have been wrong. But, but as far as I know, Paul was on his way to persecute Christians, and then he got like this shining light, where Jesus said, uh, don't do that, and, you know, be nice, please. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously mocking you, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do that, I'm sorry. Sorry for, uh, for that. Anyways, but the, the point being is that he basically um, um, got the uh, got the message from Jesus, and there are no eyewitnesses that we know of, except Paul for himself. So I need concrete statements from eyewitnesses. Luke was not an eyewitness, so you can't use Luke. I'm, I'm very specific in my claim. I'm talking about eyewitnesses, not just anyone. You know, because you you will claim that Paul saw Jesus. Any any uh, pre, uh, priest that will go into a church, you know, in the, in the uh, you know Catholic church, or whatever church, they will tell you, yeah, Paul did see Jesus. Thank you. Um, but those are not eyewitnesses, so their claim doesn't mean anything for me, right? Um, in terms of him talking about how hadiths were written centuries after, that's just factually incorrect. In, I'm going to mention to you Sunni and Shia sources where hadiths were written during the time of the prophets. Amr, um, Abdullah, the son of Amr ibn As, wrote a uh, hadith during the time of the prophets. So there you go, you're factually incorrect. Um, Sulaim ibn Qais al-Hilali, the follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib, in the, in the first Islamic century, during the time of the Prophet, wrote down hadith. And, and we have the sources today. 
So you're factually incorrect, you don't know what you're talking about theologically. Um, and the Gospels were not written during the time of Jesus. John was written 90 years later and he's the only one who claims to be an eyewitness. He's the only one who does that. Mark, Matthew, whichever one you want to say that was, you know, was during the time of Jesus. Does Mark claim to be an eyewitness? Does Matthew claim to be an eyewitness? Prove it please. Bring out a statement where, where Mark says, I will write here and I saw this, you know, word for word happening. Come on, show it to me. Are we done? Yeah. Can I reply? Got reply. Okay. So I'm going to show him again that he's a complete, working to a completely double standard. Point to me the Muslim witness about Jesus Christ's life. Go on. Here you are demanding, show me where Mark says he's an eyewitness. Show me one Muslim who says he was an eyewitness to the life of Jesus Christ. None. Not one. What you've got is a book written in a foreign language, written a thousand years, sorry, not a thousand, a thousand miles away, written hundreds of years too late, that claims to testify to things that nobody witnessed. And nobody claims to have witnessed. Now, by comparison, all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, all of them say Christ was crucified. The Quran says Christ was not crucified. Let's just give him his point. Let's say that all of the Gospels are anonymous and we do not know who wrote them. What does that have to do with whether they're correct or not about Jesus Christ crucified? He's a philosopher, he claims. So he's familiar with thought experiment. In a thought experiment in which someone who knows you hands to me an anonymous document that reveals your name and your address, does the fact that it is anonymous mean that the facts are not the facts? Of course not. And he knows that that's correct. So anonymity of the Gospels is actually completely irrelevant to whether they are correct about Jesus Christ being crucified. And what do we do when we have two testimonies that are making an argument about one fact? What do we do? We ask, who was closer to the time? Who was closer to the place? That's the Gospels. That's the writings of Paul. That's the early church. The early church fathers were writing in the first century talking about the crucifixion. But then what do we do? We look for other people's evidence. If you go to Tacitus, Josephus and other Roman and Jewish historians, they talk about Christ's crucifixion. That means all of the evidence says Christ was crucified and the Quran is wrong. Which means it's factually false. Which means it's not true. Which means it isn't from God. Amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the reality is that at no point is he willing to engage in his own double standards. He demands types of evidence from me that he can't provide himself. He said, show me where Mark is an eyewitness. Well, I challenge him, show me where anyone claims in these words, I was an eyewitness to Christ not being crucified. I don't want them saying Christ was crucified, no, wasn't crucified. I want them to say I was an eyewitness that he wasn't crucified. He's working to a double standard and he knows it. Okay, uh, I really like your way of like, you know... Uh, Everybody loves me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 he's, very, he's very like passionate in, um, in his, in his like, way of debate, so it's very, very cool. But, but the thing is, by the way, I'm not a philosopher. Like, I, in school, I was like pretty good at it. And uh, like right now, I'm not, I'm not studying philosophy. I study medicine at university, so it's a, a different subject. But the point being is that um, that I haven't like an interest of, in, in philosophy. It's, it's my personal hobby. Um, so that's one thing. The uh, another thing is that the the Quran, per the Muslim claim or the Islamic claim, is the words, the, are the literal words of God. And the Bible uh, or the four Gospels, they are. The, uh, the accounts of men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. This, this is as far as I understand Christian theology. So, so the Holy Spirit within Christian theology is obviously God. Right? It's part of the triune um, God. So, like, to what extent will, will the Holy Spirit ensure that they thank you that the um, that the that the writers of the um, of of the four Gospels won't make any mistakes, right? How can we verify that those individuals were even inspired by the by, by God? Like, 
objectively speaking. The chain of the Quran, right, because when, when, when God Almighty in the Quran says, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّيهَ لَهُمْ Which means that they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but, the, but this was made apparent to them. This, this is the, the direct word of God, because Hafs, the, the son of Sulaiman, God read the Quran from Asim, from uh, the son of Abi Najud, who read from Abi Abdurrahman al Sulami, who read from Ali ibn Abi Talib, who, who read from the Prophet, and the Prophet from the from Angel Gabriel, and from God. So I know you don't accept those chains and you say that the Muslims made them up. That's, that's, that's a fair claim to make. But our, but our uh, Quran, we claim it to be the direct word of God. And God has been present throughout all times. But God is omnipresent, right? But the, uh, the writers of the Gospel do not claim to be omnipresent. But the, also the Quran claims to be omnipresent. So the, the comparison is not correct in my view. Can I reply? You may reply. So please note guys, when I asked him to do what he asked me to do, he didn't do it. No Muslim witness to the life of Jesus Christ. And what did he say? Wow, the Quran is the word of Allah. Well, the gospel is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Praise the Spirit. So there you go. Yeah, if he can appeal to the divine origins of the Quran, yeah, we can nice. appeal to the divine inspiration of the Bible. Oh, so our argument is secure. Yeah. It does not matter yeah. at all yeah. whether we can prove that Luke wrote Luke. We believe that. Absolutely we do. Yeah. The church has said, believe this gospel and this gospel and this gospel and this gospel. And that's it. The debate is finished. Those are the Gospels that we believe. We don't care if there are other Gospels. We don't care if you don't like the names on the Gospels. We believe those Gospels because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now notice he said the Hafs Quran. But what about the Wash Quran? And the Duri Quran? And all the other Qurans that we found? He'll have a list for all of them, I am sure. But... Why do you need a list unless the integrity is in doubt? Why don't you have a list of the Gospels? Because right from the very beginning, we knew who wrote them and where their origins were. That's why you don't have a list of who wrote Luke, because the list is literally one. Luke. And we don't have a list for Matthew, because the list is one. Matthew. And we don't have a list for John because the list is one. John! And we don't have a list for Mark because the list is one. Mark! That's why we don't have lists. And we don't need lists. But they need lists because the Qurans that they use are dated to after Muhammad's death. Muhammad never saw the Hafs Quran. Never, never. If you went to Muhammad and say, hey Muhammad, yeah. here's a Hafs Quran, he'll say, that doesn't look like anything that Zaid wrote. Why? Because the diatrical marks were inserted after Muhammad's death. Furthermore, at the time of Muhammad, there wasn't even a single Quran. <laughs> it was scraps on bones and sheets and leaves and one of them was eaten by a sheep. <laughs> and that Quran had literature in it according to um, Sunni hadiths that we don't find in the Quran today, like stoning adulterers. And I want to stop by asking him a simple question. Do you believe that Muslims made up Isnad chains connected to hadiths, Sunni Muslims? Did they make up false Isnad chains? Okay, um... So, there's just one statement from Bob that I would like to focus on, and I also answer the question. But, but, but the funny thing is, he said, we know who the gospel writers were. We, we know of Mark. It was Mark. Can you tell me who the father of Mark is? Can you tell me who... Can you, for example, tell me who, who said that Mark was, um, was like an authority, that, that he for example, had, had good memory, that he was precise in his account? Thank you. Okay. He was a scribe, but who said that he was? He, he was. Um, that he scribe, and his accounts are accepted. Do you want me to pause and okay. that answer? No, 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 no. Let me focus on your point. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so the point being is, we need individuals that actually authenticate those uh, writers of the gospel. When I, when, when I quote, quote, quote that chain, 
from a house all the way, all the way to the property. Two minutes. We, we know each and every single individual. We know who their father is. Like we, we, we even know their lineages. We know we have biographies of them in very specific details. Where they were born, where they died, who they read from. All of that is known. The gospel writers are completely... Not, the guy doesn't even tell you that I saw this. How can you take it? How can you accept it to be an authority? Mark doesn't say, guys, uh, I was with Jesus today and I saw this. He, he doesn't even say that. So all of those accounts are basically not even eyewitnesses. <laughs> so, you know, for a Muslim, this is very, very like, difficult to accept. Because you're taking a, a, accounts from someone who was not even verified. The guy, like, Mark was not verified by Jesus, nor was he verified by, um, by uh, what's it called, um, Simon or Peter. So how is his account acceptable? Based on, based on what, uh, you know, rational reason? With us, the Prophet verified who, uh, his, his own cousin, Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, Man kuntu mawla, fada Ali mawla. Whomever I am, his leader, Ali is his leader. He said, Ali is, is, has, has the most authority uh, um, upon the people after me. And uh, Abi, Abi Abdul Rahman al-Sulami was among the, the closest companions of Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is mentioned in Al-Kashi, who is one of the uh, known, you know, um, biographers of narrators. And, um, you know, and within Sunni thought, he's, he's also authentic. We know of all of those men, but, who, but who's Mark? So to, to answer his question about... Um, 30 seconds. Uh, yeah. So, to, to quickly answer his question about, do, do Sunnis uh, fabricate uh, Snad? No. Sometimes, I mean, fabrication exists within, within Shia works. You will find fabricated narrations within Shia works or within Sunni works. It's not, I mean, when they narrate from Aisha uh, authentically, that is generally the, the saying of Aisha. Obviously, then I will dispute whether Aisha is telling the truth or not, but, but, that, but that is the actual saying of Aisha. Like, when, when the hadith is authentic, right? So no, the, you know, fabricated narrations are both in Sunni and Shia literature. It's not a, it's not a Sunni only thing. Yeah. Three minutes, Bob. Okay, so his whole argument assumes that the early Christian church didn't know one another. A careful reading of the New Testament demonstrates that Mark was the traveling companion of Paul, who then went on to support St. Peter. The early church had understood who wrote its gospels. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have Isnad chains. Because we don't need Isnad chains. All of this, oh, you don't know how good his memory was and you don't know who his father was. It's completely irrelevant. It doesn't prove anything that you, could, that you have someone who came later saying someone from the past had a good memory. And not only that, that's not what we say about Mark. We say Mark heard Peter. Now think about it. If you're going to make up the author of Mark, which is what my brother's trying to suggest, why wouldn't you just pick an apostle and call it the Gospel of Peter? Surely that would have more weight. There's no apostle called Mark. The very fact that they ascribe it to Mark tells you that they're not making it up. Because if you were going to make it up, you'd call it the Gospel of Thaddeus, or the Gospel of John, or the Gospel of Barnabas, or the Gospel of Peter. You wouldn't call it the Gospel of the Scribe of Peter. So the, the, the very fact ladies and gentlemen, that they don't make up an apostle's name as the author of the gospel tells you, A, they knew who it was, and B, they just weren't making it up. Absolutely. The next point is that every text that we have, yeah. all of them, universally, 100%, says the gospel of Mark is the gospel of Mark. The gospel of John is the gospel of John, the gospel of Luke is the gospel of Luke, and the gospel of Matthew is the gospel of Matthew. If they were just making it up in an age without the internet, in an age without the, uh, the, 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 the conspiracy, what would they do? You'd find in one part of the world, the Gospel of Matthew would be called the Gospel of Matthew, but in another part of the world, the Gospel of Matthew would be called the Gospel of Zebedee. Correct. But you don't see that. You see everywhere in the world, for all documents, all of them, the Gospel of Matthew, is the Gospel of Matthew. Why? Why? Because the knowledge of the authorship was there in the birth of the church. Amen. Early church fathers from the first century quote 
Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Meaning that they were already in widespread circulation <laughs> by the years 100 to 200. Time, Bob. Bring it. So the claim that the Gospels were widespread is a very, very substantial claim. You don't have anyone who's memorized your Gospels. No one has memorized it. It's when, when the, well, because you can just write like 10 copies. Okay, you have 10 copies. The Muslims in the thousands, each and every single generation has been what we call mutawato, which means mass transmitted, which means that it's impossible for thousands of people to sit together and make up the Quran. Your, your Gospels, 10, 20 copies. So what? I can sit and write 10, 20 copies. What is that? There's nothing. None, none of you guys have, have actually memorized your, your text. We have memorized it, so our oral transmission is what we depend on. The, 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 um, the scribes and whatever, it doesn't matter. This is why I'm, I'm focusing on how can you take from Mark when, when, when you, for example, don't know how good his memory was. The, the brother, uh, Bob, <laughs> literally said, we don't care if... Uh, like Bob Badum, he's like, we don't, we don't care if, uh, if Mark's memory was good or not. He basically said, I, I do not know if um, Mark's uh, memory was good or not and, and who his father was. Look, who his father was is not significant in of itself. It just shows that we know a lot about the actual narrator, right? Who, his, his lineage, his trustworthiness, how much he memorized. You have none of that in your books, right? Which means that when you, when you for example, tell me that, that, that Mark's... Um, um, memorization is, is unknown. So why'd you rely upon him? You, you could have had a terrible memory, and he and he could have written all sorts of things, right? When we, for example, have scholars like Yahya ibn Ma'in and and like uh, on the Sunni side um, and, and on the Shia side, our own Imams testify so and so. Take from him, for example, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Abu Zainab ibn Abi Khattab. He was, an, he was a known Ghali in, in Shia Islamic Quran Ghali. He was someone who, was a, who would exaggerate the stages of the Imams and he would make them into gods. The Imam said this guy's memory was terrible when, when he was a Muslim, now he was a disbeliever. So that's one example of a contemporary saying that, saying that, that this guy's memory is terrible, right? Or Yahya ibn Ma'in saying, for example, Wahin, or uh, uh, you know, his, he, he, his memory is bad. You have none of that about Mark. You, have, you, you know nothing about him. Whether he was precise in his, in his writings, whether he wasn't precise. You don't even know who his father was, which is again, not significant of itself, but it, but it shows that, that you guys haven't like encompassed uh, your, the individuals who actually narrate your religion, which is very, very significant for a Muslim. We want, we want to know who, who basically narrated our religion, and we have that, and you do not. Okay, so shall we stop to bring this to a close? We can. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, he says we don't know anything about Mark. We know Mark was a travelling companion of Paul. We know Mark was the transcriber of Peter's sermons. We know Mark founded the African church in Egypt, the Coptic church. We do know stuff about Mark. He doesn't know stuff about Mark. Not us. We know who Mark was. We know who he wrote Mark's gospel. He doesn't know. And all he's saying is, well, you don't know who his father was. So what? It's, as he has already admitted, it's a non-point. It's not relevant. And uh, furthermore, let's be clear. We believe Mark, Matthew, Luke and John because the church tells us to believe Mark, Matthew, Luke and John. Amen. It doesn't matter what you say about the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. We believe them. Okay? That's the end of that debate. We believe these Gospels. They're our authorities. That authority is given to it by the same church that received them, by the same church that followed the people that wrote them, by the same church that knew them. And he hasn't addressed any of the circumstantial evidence that demonstrates that the knowledge of the authorship of the Gospels is supremely early. If they were just making it up, they would make it up that an apostle wrote it. Not a companion of an apostle, but they don't. And if they were going to make it up, you would find some copies of the Gospel of Mark that had a different name on it from other copies of the Gospel of Mark that had a different name on it. And you would find Christians arguing about who wrote the Gospel of Mark because I've got my document that says it was Zebedee and you've got your document saying it was Mark. No 
There was no debate in the early church about who wrote the Gospels. One minute. None. There was debate about which books to include in the New Testament. There was debate about which books to include in the Old Testament because there wasn't agreement about that. But there was universal agreement from east to west, north to south, from Ethiopia to England, that Mark wrote Mark, Matthew wrote Matthew, John wrote John, and Luke wrote Luke, and they had no means to communicate with one another across the world. Which shows that the tradition that gives the authors of the gospel was there in the first century, was there between the years 33 AD and the year 100. Amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, at no point has my interlocutor bothered to be consistent in his criticisms. And unfortunately, I don't have time to summarize them. So we'll do one more round. You can summarize, I'll summarize, and we'll do okay, So I'll, I mean, this is going to be the last, the last bit because uh, obviously, you know, we, we, we've been at it for a while and it, it was a very uh, engaging discussion. I thought it was very you know, fruitful and uh, enjoyable for me personally. Yeah. Um, but, but just. Just a comment on um, on what Paul mentioned. So he, so he said, we, we know that Mark, you know, was it, accompanied Paul, and we know he narrated so and so. This is not this is not significant. We have individuals that lived decades with, uh, with, for example, Prophet Muhammad, who who were both Sunnis and Shias, deemed as liars. For example, um, you know, um, what's his name? The guy who was known as the head of the the hypocrites. So just just because you accompany a good person. If we were to actually accept that Paul is a good person, if we were, but just because you accompany a good person doesn't make you a good person, and, and just because you narrated X, Y, and Z doesn't mean that your narration is precise, or, or, or that you have a good memory. So this is insignificant. What, you, what he just mentioned, right? So, I mean, I personally think, thank you. I personally think that I've been very consistent because I've asked um, with, with brother Paul to, uh, sorry, not Paul, <laughs> Bob, to, to to bring um to bring. You know, verses from, from the Bible that attest, like, like, in a bullet point faction, ways in which a person can reach uh, paradise, and he's brought some some verses which he thought you know could could prove that. I've I've, I've disputed it. In my opinion, they're not clear enough, and um, they can be interpreted in other ways, especially the Old Testament and the writings of apostles who I don't even know like why we should take from them, uh, because as a Muslim, I obviously only adhere to the teachings of Jesus and Simon Peter. Uh, those are the two people that I, that I you know, would take my religion from, not an apostle who who, who basically claims uh, things, you know, that, that no one else can verify. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, that's that's essentially the, the summary of, of our debate here. Okay. One minute. Can we use it? So I'm going to use my three minutes. So what you saw, uh, you, you've literally seen two debates back to back. First debate: What must you do to be saved? When we showed clear evidence from the words of Jesus Himself that you must believe that his blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins. And he commands people to believe that in when he sends out in the Great Commission. And we saw that the prophets taught that. And we saw that the apostles taught that. And what we saw was no biblical argument that we were wrong. Just some fudging of the issue around what's the significance of the wine. Not the actual shedding of the blood for the forgiveness of sins. Then we saw a whole bunch of double standards. Show me exact words in your Bible where Jesus says. And then we showed him, but he still didn't believe it. But then when I asked him to do the same from the Quran to show me Jesus said exact words, he couldn't do it. Then he said, show me where Mark claims to be a gospel writer, a witness to what Jesus taught. And I said, well, we can't show you that statement, it's not there, but show me a Muslim that claims to be a witness to the life of Jesus Christ. And he couldn't do it. But then he appealed to the fact that the Quran is divine scripture to justify the Quran's claims. Well, I claim the scriptures as divinely inspired to justify that right there. Amen. So again and again and again, the Shia polemicist is working to double standards that when you flip him back on his own religion, the Islam fails. His Islam fails. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the evidence has been presented before you that you shouldn't believe the authority of the Gospels because we don't know about the authors. Right, hold on a minute. 
did anyone hear evidence that showed that Mark did not write Mark? Or that Luke did not write Luke? Or that Matthew did not write Matthew? All he did was ask questions. All he did is say, well, you don't know this and you don't know that. What about all the stuff that we do know? Like the fact that Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark Amen. and that's what the Church Fathers teach. Like the fact that every copy of the Gospel of Mark says Mark wrote it. Like the fact that the Church Fathers say that Mark was the author of Mark. And that we know where Mark died. And we know that the church that Mark founded, the Coptic church, an African church, unlike Islam, Christianity is an African religion as much as it is a European religion, as much as it is a Middle Eastern religion. Beautiful. Beautiful. Not like Islam that's about Arabization Ooh. and different cultures submitting to Arabization. Ooh, Just like the Copts, the Egyptians had their own language and civilization and now they've been Arabized. Sad. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth is laid out before you. You saw it on film, on Soko Films. Watch the whole entire debate. And you'll see who's telling the truth. Anyway, it's lovely to speak to you. Respecting the rules and for being respectful. Apologies if I was a bit unnecessarily rude to you earlier. Yeah, that's a Christian way. God bless you, bro. Bro, you. It was lovely to speak to you. I want to give you a gift. This is for you. Love you. And you're more than welcome to come back and talk to me again. I already read your other booklet. I gave it back to you. Great. And I gave it to Kay, but she gave it to another Muslim. Fantastic. So you can read that and then you can bring it back if you want to or you can ask questions about it. But I, I want to challenge you, I want to challenge you to a debate about whether Christ was crucified. Well, we can have that. That, that. that would be an interesting debate. Okay. Uh, I, I, I had to do research on it because, um, uh, but yeah, I, will, I can never miss that. Okay. Great. All right then. Okay. God bless you. Bless Take you. care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace Christ. Take care. Well, pray for you. Okay, guys, any questions on what you heard before we go? Let's go for a meal with Jay. Any questions before you go? Any questions? 20 minutes. Why, why didn't you refer to the epistle of Peter? He said he had seven of Peter. The, the, just because, like, in the midst of all the verses to quote, that just didn't get to it. But yeah, Peter was certainly another example where Peter talked, because like, I quoted. Um, Ephesians and I quoted Hebrews where it's explicit that Christ's blood is shed for the forgiveness of sins. Peter is another one that I could have used, I just didn't get to it. The thing about three minute debates is you're trying to find the verse, listen to the points and think about your own. So they, I'm not perfect. But yeah, any other questions? In the Gospel of Matthew, the Muslim makes a claim that in the Gospel of Matthew, it is written that Matthew went from this point to that point. So they make a point that how can Matthew write in the Gospel of Matthew that Matthew went from this point to that point. If he's writing the Matthew chapter, like Matthew Gospel, he should write, I went from this point to that point. Because if, if, Matthew is, if Matthew is writing retrospectively, and he's writing for a third party audience, if he's speaking about all that, if he's talking about the, 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 the story of the apostles as the third person, then to be consistent in his writing, he would obviously speak of himself in the third person because he's not writing an autobiography, he's writing a biography. So his story is about Jesus and his relation to Jesus. I mean, this, but, but, but what, a, what a small and pathetic point that is to make that in no way damages the, the belief in the gospel at all. You know, and, and there are, there's examples in the Quran where Allah seems to misspeak where, where it says, for instance, in the Quran that this is the message and it refers to the Prophet Muhammad. You know, that this is the message of a Prophet called Muhammad, that these are the words of a Prophet, I think is more exact, you know. So the, the thing is, we can both play those nitpicky games. Even the Quran chapter 1 verse number 1, where it says, Bismillah and Manarim. In the name of Allah. Yeah. So Allah is speaking in the third person. So how yeah. can Allah say the Bismillah? Exactly. Exactly. So, why is Allah praying to himself? Go on. Uh, how important do you prefer to in this debate and study? But, uh, more generally, how important do you think secondary evidence like linguistics and archaeology is in establishing the Iraq authorship of the New Testament, especially the Gospel? I think it's, it's very useful. All evidence is good evidence. And the thing is, when you look, when you read the Book of Acts carefully, make a note of the names and the places, 
and then go and look at the archaeological discoveries that confirm those names and places. The small details that the gospel writers get right tell you that they're familiar with the geography, they're familiar with the people that they're writing about. And actually, you know, Luke even is lauded by, by other historians as being a great historian himself. You know, and Luke make, is very clear, he investigated everything that the church is saying about the life of Jesus and then he organizes it into an orderly account, which means that he is compiling what people have said. And that, that was written independently of John, was written independently of Mark and of Matthew. It's, it's a separate transmission of literature. And when you, when you investigate the sort of context more and more, like when we study First Temple, Second Temple Judaism, we find that Second Temple Judaism aligns with the beliefs that we find in the New Testament about the Son of Man, being a divine figure, a suffering servant. And these are not Christian literature. These are Jewish literature from the Second Temple. So in terms of, and there's no greater witness that to the authorship of the Gospels than the tradition of the church, which teaches who the Gospel writers were and did so because after the initial generation had passed away, who were familiar with who'd wrote what, people then started asking questions. Well, who wrote this book? And so they had to say, oh, it's Matthew that wrote this book. It was Mark that wrote this book. It was Luke that wrote this book. It was John that wrote this book. In that first generation, that was already understood who had written that book. And that's why we don't need Isnad chains. You needed a Isnad chain for the Hafs Quran because Muhammad never saw in his life something that looked like the Hafs Quran. You need an Isnad chain for the Wash Quran because Muhammad never saw something that looked like the Wash Quran in his entire life. And so they have to justify the existence of the Hafs, the Wash, the Duri, and the 30 odd other Qurans that we've discovered. Okay, guys. That's it. So, one more yeah, one more question. Yes? Yeah. It's Muslims I've learned in this part, they like to quote from the. Uh, they, they've got a very favourite favorite verse. Yeah. And the Gospel of Mark, which they like to quote in Mark 13 to 32, which reads, What of the day and hour? No one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. Yet they claim that Jesus Christ is not. They, 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 they use this verse yeah. in order to refute you, yes, that Jesus is God. Yeah. Yes. Okay. How do you respond to this? So the fact is that the scriptures are clear. Christ was fully human. Agreed? Agreed. He was like us in every way. Agreed? Yes. Do human beings know everything? No. No. Right. So that's the first point of this argument. Christ was fully human. Christ's humanity was like ours in every way. Human beings don't know everything. How then do we understand that Jesus is divine because God does know everything? Are we agreed? God knows everything. Right. In the hypostatic union, there is a, a unity in the person of Jesus Christ between his humanity and his divinity. The knowledge of the day and the hour was there in the person of Christ. It was present bodily. That knowledge was there in his humanity. But his humanity did not have access to the knowledge in the same way that you all know things. There's knowledge in your mind that you're not alive to, that you're not aware of. It's unconscious knowledge. Now the thing, the extreme example that draws out this fact is trauma. People who suffer trauma often deny and, and, and suppress the memories of the trauma that they experience. Meaning that a human being can have knowledge of something but not awareness of something. So when Christ says, no one knoweth the day or the hour, no, not, not, not the Son, not the angels, but the Father only, that knowledge is present in his person, but because of his humanity, his ability to pick it up is not there. And, and the reason why is because of kenosis. The fact that he emptied himself into his human nature and thus he set the parameters of his, the limits of his own knowledge. 
Because people who say that Christ knew everything must assert that from being a baby in the womb, Christ knew how to speak. Because that's something that you acquire. Linguistics is something you can forget. Anyone know two languages? Anyone know that if you don't practice one of those languages, you forget? So language is something you can forget. If you're saying, if you insist that Christ knew everything, then you have to insist Christ knew how to speak and did not learn how to speak. But it says in scripture that Christ grew in wisdom and stature in the Gospel of Luke. So he grew in wisdom and stature, which means that he learned. So when Christ emptied his divinity into a humanity, he limited what that humanity could access in terms of knowledge from the divine essence. Doesn't mean that that knowledge was not there. It was there, but Christ's humanity couldn't access it because when Christ created his humanity, he limited what he would be able to access as a human being. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, shall we go? Christ is risen! Christ is risen! Christ is risen! Amen.